Now, how deep is this? Welcome to the Hobart Commuter. So it's been a while since I did my last video, probably close to a year, and I was contacted recently by a viewer, Morrison Hayes, there's a name, who reminded me that I had promised uh, to deliver a final episode of the, of the Hobart Commuter. Um, thank you, Morrison, you're absolutely right, I did promise to deliver a final episode. Um, thank you for the reminder, and thank you for the kind words as well that came with it. I had actually planned to do this episode closer to the penultimate episode, but uh, fate intervened as fate has a way of doing. Um, so, I thought for this episode, I would take you down the beautiful South Hobart rivulet. Now, this is spring at the moment in Hobart. The blossom is out, as you can see. The birds are chirping, which you may not be able to hear. And the sun is kind of creeping out. It's a little bit overcast today, but what more of a bucolic, Arcadian, New Eden environment could you imagine than this? So what a way to celebrate the last episode. And you can see the rivulet there down on my right-hand side and the lovely procession of trees to celebrate this final episode of the Hobart Commuter. However, however, sometimes you just don't want beauty. You're just not in the mood for it. Sometimes you want dark and unforgiving and ugly and sordid. You wanted what Chuck Palahniuk was reaching for in Fight Club when he said, I wanted to open the dump valves on the oil tankers and smother all the French beaches that I'd never see. I wanted to breathe smoke. Sometimes you do just want to breathe smoke. You want to descend into Hades. And for that, you need to get off the garden path and down into the deep, dark tunnels. Now, I am, of course, being facetious. I'm not in some kind of nihilistic malaise. Uh, coming down here. The reason why I'm down here is because a former alderman, Tanya Dennison, before she went, she, um, she petitioned the Hobart City Council to conduct a feasibility study into the possibility of turning this rivulet into a pedestrian and cyclist commuting pathway. Now, Tanya is a, a chartered engineer, as well as being a, um, she's done either her masters or her, or she's doing a masters in sustainability. So she's coming this, from this, from a position I think of authority. It, it's, this idea isn't without precedent either. There's a few countries that have done this around the world. Most notably, uh, there's a thing called the path in Toronto. Now, I like this idea for its sheer whoa, creativity. Um, why not dream big? It also ticks a few boxes in terms of getting the reluctant rider on the road. This water is as cold as it looks. Now, what I mean by that is when they do studies or do surveys on um, what would get people riding their bikes or what is actually, um, what makes people reluctant to ride their bikes on the road, almost invariably, the number one thing is, um, is safety reasons. So a pathway down here would get bikes off the road. So it's, it ticks that box for separate, ticks that box, whoops, for separate infrastructure. 
which I think is important. One of the other things too is, the other thing that people mention doesn't allow them to ride or makes them reluctant to ride is the weather. And so having this, this pathway that's underground out of the elements, that could as well inspire people to get on their bikes and um, get a form of exercise. I'll come back to both of those points though and I'll, I'll argue against them, but I'll do so when we're down into the tunnels because I think that'll provide a bit more context about what I want to talk about or my arguments against. But also why I like this idea is it's, um, it could serve as a tourist attraction as well. And if there's something that Hobart and Tasmania does really well, it's tourism. As you can see, I, I haven't picked the best. Well, I have not picked the best weekend to do this. We've had a little bit of heavy rain. Um, nevertheless, all this rain and all this water, obviously this is one of the main catchments of, um, of Mount Wellington, which is the big mountain that overlooks Hobart. So one of the big structural logistical engineering feats that you have to get over was you'd have to obviously redirect this water somewhere else. So that would be a big deal. Um, and the other thing too is, as we're about to experience here, there's a lot of enclosed confined spaces. So this would have to be reasonably well lit. I think it's time to get on our bike and actually commute. Um, these would have to be reasonably well lit and also there'd have to be exit points um, to make people feel safe. That's obviously not a luxury that's going to be afforded to me. I'm hoping that I won't meet anyone who um, takes a front to me by being down here. I'm really not sure what I'm going to expect. The ducks, there will be ducks, there's animals, that's cool. Animals I don't mind. Um, but I'm kind of hoping if anyone I meet, I can placate them with the, um, the promise of a guest appearance on the last ever episode of the Hobart Commuter. Which could, could, be, could be attractive, who knows? Could be a gateway to Hollywood. Morrison Hayes could be a producer executive producer for Paramount, for all I know. All right, so I've got some lights here because we're going to get in the darkness soon. Um, I hope it's going to be enough. I'll get my head torch out as well. Um, I used to have this brilliant head torch. It was as bright as a miner's head torch, I swear to God. If I was a miner, I'd be a damn good one. All right, so a little bit of history about the rivulet. So it is, as I mentioned, the main catchment area for, um, for Mount Wellington. My bike is broken, I'm afraid. I can't pedal, so I'm just going to have to tap myself along. So Mount Wellington sees about 300, 300 days a year of rain. So there's a fair amount of water that, that goes through here. Uh, it was a a major water source for the Tasmanian Aborigines and also for the European settlers as well. They, um, they basically built Hobart around this rivulet because it was such a good source of fresh water. And it kind of fell into, um, kind of became a bit of a sewer in the mid 19th century. Man, I can't see anything down here. Oy! Yeah, it became a bit of a sewer, and there are stories of um, like animal carcasses cruising along the river, I suspect in a flood. There was a lot of um, textile industries that abutted the rivulet as well during that time, and obviously environmental laws not being what they are today, they would have transferred a lot of their chemicals and effluent and that sort of thing into the system, so it was pretty bad. And in fact, if you go up towards South Hobart, um, you'll see the kind of remains or the, the shells of some of those textile industries. There's a tannery factory up there, which is um, obviously making this, the, the, uh, the leather from the skins and hides. There's some pretty bad chemicals in that process. Anyway, they cleaned it up. Just watch this. 
Oh, I reckon I'm going to lose an inner tube at least in this place. It is very dark. So that's behind me there. So it's pitch dark. Anyway, uh, they cleaned it up and basically um, Hobart was built. Oy, Hobart was built over it. It's quite noisy down here. Hobart was built over it, which is why we've got these um, these tunnels. Now, just in case you're thinking this is a bit of a stunt on my part, it kind of is, but conceivably this could be a commute. Um, actually, I'll just pause here for a minute. Let's just have a look at what's up here. So that's the mall up there, I think. That's um, up there, you can probably see, that's the, the uh, Elizabeth Mall. And there's all these little tunnels too. Hang on, I'll show you. Oh. There's all these little tunnels that go down in strange places. So obviously there's a lot of, now there's no way I'm going down there. But there's all these little tunnels that run off and obviously feed into the rivulet. Yeah, so this basically will come out eventually at the Royal Hobart Hospital, which I used to do some work at. So conceivably, if I came through South Hobart, this could be my commute to work. Mind you, I wouldn't want to do this every day. Now, the reason why I don't particularly like this idea um, is for the reasons I mentioned before. So I talked about it being separate infrastructure. I don't like being pushed off the road by cars. I, I know that we need some separate infrastructure, but it's just, it's another example of, us, of bikes literally being shoved underneath the streets in this case, into the dark spaces. And I'd much rather be riding with the cars than being in, um, in something like this. And the other reason too is, I talked about the elements. One of the great joys of riding your bike, I think, is being in the elements. You're not in that box of glass and steel, uh, completely cut off from the natural environment. And if you have to ride in the rain every once in a while, so be it. It's such a pleasure to ride um, your bike and sort of breathe in the natural air and take in the natural sunlight. It's just gorgeous. And I think this is almost as far as we're gonna go. I'll get on my bike again. I, something wrong with my cog, it's not catching. So I'm just kind of cruising along here. And that's the hospital up there to my left. All right. Well, thank you for coming along. That was quite a trip. My feet are very wet. That is the last ever Hobart commuter. It's been an absolute pleasure to do these. And I'm really glad that Morrison actually encouraged me to finish it off and have a chance to say goodbye. And thank you all for those who watched. Thank you especially for those who commented. Um, and it's been a joy to share this with you. I won't say see you next time because that will essentially be it. And I certainly won't be going down those tunnels because I do have a, uh, something of a fear of confined spaces. So thank you for watching for the last time and look out for each other. How do I get out of here? Mm.